message a little bit later on, but uh, as you may know, we are answering the question uh, that was put in the box, which is, uh, what is the New Age religion? That's the question. And we began by defining what that was this morning, all the while, of course, comparing it to what the Bible teaches, and we'll uh, do the same thing this evening. Because although we define sort of how it works or doesn't work, as the case may be, we didn't really get into what the common tenets are of the New Age religion. And so we want to deal with three of those this evening. And the first one is monism. Monism is the idea that one is all and all is one. Not only are we part of the universe, but it is part of us. Annette Hollander explains monism in her book, How to Help Your Child Have a Spiritual Life. And uh, in that uh, book, we read that the more we can experience our interconnectedness, oneness, the less willing we will be to destroy each other and the world. We mentioned Shirley MacLaine a few times this morning. We're going to mention her a few times this evening since she is the one who has most popularized New Ageism. She wrote in the book, Out on a Limb, my whole body seemed to float, too. Not only my arms, but all of me. Slowly, slowly I became the water. And each tingling bubble was a component part of the water. I felt the inner connection of my breathing with the pulse of energy around me. The air itself seemed to pulsate. In fact, I was the air. I was the water. The darkness, the, the walls, the bubbles, the candle, the wet rocks under the water, and even the sound of the rough, uh, rushing river outside. Well, this is monism. I am all that nature is. It is all that I am. And uh, that, that, of course, is the heart of that teaching. Of course, most people uh, think that this outlook tends towards flakiness. And such ideas are so bizarre that they do uh, lend themselves to some humorous comments, as was done in the Funky Winker Bean comic strip. Funky tells Mr. Montoni that someone just ordered a large Zen pizza. And he says, what's that? One with everything. Pantheism follows right on the heels of monism. It is the brief modification to affirm that God is all and all is God. Now, this is a little bit different. And uh, as you'll see, this rather borders on, if not is outright, blasphemy. But surely helps explain this principle. The same divine will was in all living things. We were part of it and it was part of us. The task was to find that divinity in ourselves and live by it, whatever this subjective conclusion might be. Hence, the answers are all within the self. Look into yourselves. Explore yourselves. You are the universe. One marvels at uh, Shirley's theological syllogisms. Observe the following deductive process that she put forth in the book Dancing in the Light. I know that I exist, therefore I am. The capital letters are hers. I know that God, the God source exists, therefore it is. Since I am part of that force, 
then I am that I am. I think this is overstepping, don't you? But if only Rene Descartes and John Locke could be reincarnated to straighten her out on knowledge and logic, it would be helpful, maybe. Shirley has perhaps inadvertently identified herself as the one who spoke to Moses in the burning bush because it's in Exodus 3, 14 and 15 that uh, the angel of the Lord says, I am that I am meaning that he is God, he is deity, he is the eternal one. We are not. Previously in the same book, she had further explained, the ancient Hindu Vedas claimed that the spoken words I am or Aum in Hindi set up a vibrational frequency in the body and mind which aligned the individual with his or her higher self and thus the God source. Now, we haven't explained that, but Shirley believes that there's us and that we have a higher self floating around somewhere above us, I suppose. The word God in any language carries the highest vibrational frequency of any word in that language. Therefore, if anyone says audibly, I am God, the sound vibrations literally align the energies of the body to a higher attunement. Well, this is why we said this morning that what we have and what we need is in Christ Jesus. This is nothing but assertion. There, there is no evidence for any of the types of things that she is claiming. She says, you can use I am God or I am that I am as Christ often did, or you can extend the affirmations to fit your own needs. One never knows when reading Hollywood luminaries what useful information might be forthcoming. Well, pantheism, as these quotations serve to illustrate, seeks to exalt the status of mankind to that of deity, does it not? Are these not sufficient to see that that's what it's doing? Or to demote deity to the level of man, depending on your point of view. In the world of pantheism, God did not create the world. He is the world. Men were not made in the image of God, we are God. Mankind, therefore, exalts himself. And interestingly, man's first sin involved the desire to become as God, which the serpent promised would occur in Genesis 3-5. The serpent is still promising people the very same thing, just through the New Age religion instead. New Agers have merely replaced idols of wood and stone with that of flesh, with that of self. Perhaps if there were any New Agers among Planned Parenthood push the nail, they would write a book called Our Idols Ourselves. Now if you don't understand that, the book they have distributed for years is called Our Bodies Ourselves. But we won't go into what's in that book. Monism and pantheism are alternative ideas to the truth that the Bible sets forth. That God created man in his own image. He made man in his own image, Genesis 1 and verse 26. We are a little lower than the angels, but we have dominion over the works of God's hands, including the animals. Uh, let's take a quick look at a passage we oftentimes use for another purpose, but it serves to illustrate this one too. Psalm chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. Psalm chapter 8, beginning with verse 5. For you have made him, meaning man, a little lower than the angels. 
You have crowned him with glory and honor. But notice it does not say he is God. But God has exalted man over some things. You made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. Oh, now I remember where I've heard this verse. But nevertheless, it is explaining that God has put man over all of his creation, just as it is also affirmed in Genesis chapter 1. The albatross and the whale are not my brothers, as stated in the song Cool Change by Little River Band. Man is over creation, not equal to it. Likewise, God is over man, not equal to man. His ways and his thoughts are above our thoughts. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. And we do not share equal rights with deity. Do you not remember Job learning that lesson? Job wanted to defend himself before God. He wanted to question God. And God says, Job, I have a few questions for you to answer. And after God asked the question, Job recognized that God is the one who is superior and that you don't ask questions. God can ask questions of you. He's the creator. But he is not bound to answer your questions, although generally he does. In Romans chapter 9 and verse 20, Paul writes, But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? The twin concepts of mono, uh, monism and pantheism may sound exotic to the Western mind and, and may uh, pique people's curiosity and want them to explore further, but they have long been the staples of backward and failed Eastern societies. Jesus is the only one who can claim to be God because he was God in the flesh. As John writes in John 1 verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And he also recorded all of the miracles that Jesus did, which prove beyond any doubt that he is who he claimed to be. The Son of God, John 20, 30 and 31. Now, he claimed to be God in John 58, as we read earlier when he said, Before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones to kill him, which would have been the right thing to do for them if he was not actually God. If he had been an imposter, if he had been Shirley MacLaine, they would have been within their rights to take up stones and to kill him because that is blasphemy. No human being should ever make such a claim. And by the way, everyone who ever has died. The God who is eternal still lives. But every human being who has ever claimed to be God from Roman emperors uh, to other deities, uh, so-called, they have all died, and they are no longer with us. There is only one who is God. Now, the third thing we want to talk about this evening is evolution. Darwin's theory of evolution fits hand in glove with monotheism, pantheism, uh, and also with some other things, but we want to note that since the overall thrust of New Ageism is self-discovery, it only makes sense that we might imagine we have reached our high state of development through evolution. And that we can advance even further with just a little more cerebral 
development. Uh, Shirley MacLaine, who seems to do some of her best reasoning when she's all wet, comments, as I lay in the tub thinking, I wondered how long it would be before scientists would find ways to verify the evolution of the soul in the same way they had verified the evolution of the body. Hmm. The following is a uh, excerpt from the Celestine prophecy that we talked about this morning. I perceived everything to be somehow part of me. I experienced the entire universe looking out on itself through me. The realization was present that my life did not, in fact, begin with my conception and birth on this planet. I can just about hear the Twilight Zone music at this point. It began much earlier with the formation of the rest of me, my real body, the universe itself. I watched as the first matter exploded in the universe. And then what follows is an imaginary description of the formation of the universe from the author's fertile mind. He intentionally refers to evolution as a science, which it is not. Shirley mistakenly thinks that the evolution of the body has been proved. But why should she question that since it fits so well with her beliefs? Actually, no one knows how evolution is supposed to work. The possible mechanisms which Darwin described in On the Origin of Species have all been discredited. We now know that every possible explanation he offered doesn't work. And the missing links are still missing. Nobody's ever found them. The latest rage is the punctuated equilibrium theory in which it is uh, stated that the gradual changes in species have been interrupted by radical and sudden transformational jumps. Now, you know, for decades, evolution was so slow, you could never see it. It just, you know, that's why you had to have billions of years, because the change was that slow. And they found out that billions of years wasn't enough. So they had to come up with something. They couldn't go, obviously, to creation or the flood, which changed drastically the world. No, they had to come up with another theory, and this is it. This kind of sounds like a leap of faith, doesn't it? There is as much evidence for this New Age hypothesis as there was for Darwin's ideas. None. No evidence. Although New Ageism stresses one's personal development, the potential danger has, uh, that has always characterized evolution remains. Many people, when they figure out that evolution means that there is no sovereign deity who will call upon mankind to account for his actions, Pantheism doesn't do that. Monism doesn't do that. Evolution doesn't do that. They will react the same way that a young man did who wrote a book against New Age theory. His name was Elliot Miller. We mentioned him this morning. And here is what he came to conclude and why. The week before, I, he'd always been in Christian schools. The week, but he went to a public school for eighth grade. The week before I started eighth grade, I convinced my parents to let me return to the public school. And in my science class that year, I was the first exposed to the theory of evolution. Like a domino effect, the following conclusions fell upon my mind in their turn. No Adam and Eve, no infallible Bible, no God, no hell, freedom. And all of that is exactly the right conclusion. If there is no God, if there is no truth about Adam and Eve, 
If the Bible is not the word of God and infallible, if there is no God, then nobody can tell me anything. And especially if there's no punishment. I have complete freedom to do and say whatever I want. And you can see why that's attractive to a lot of people. Of course, it's false, but it's an attractive idea. These sentiments may also help to explain the popularity of evolution in the absence of proof and in the New Age religion. There is no moral accountability within the New Age system. Lord willing, we'll talk about that next Sunday morning, the morals, the morality aspect. But we'll just say ahead of time, there is no moral accountability within that system. Perhaps not so coincidentally, there's also a lack of moral character and evidence among New Agers, at least as the Bible defines morality. Mankind is not one with nature, including the trees and the vegetation or animals. God created mankind in his image. Chapter 1, verse 27 of Genesis says that very thing. God created, created, not changed a monkey into a human. God created man in his own image. That's why animals have instincts. They don't reason. Uh, they don't think. They haven't written books, what it was like to be a young monkey or whatever, they don't do those things because they have not that ability. And God put mankind over creation. Neither are we deity. The very idea is blasphemous. We are invited to be his children, though, through obedience to the gospel. Let's notice 1 John chapter 3 and uh, verse 1. 1 John chapter 3. And verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Notice, not God, but the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because the world did not know him. Genesis 1 says that God specifically created us. We did not evolve. We are not glorified animals. We are made in his image. Now, if you're watching online and you'd like to know more about uh, the things that we have discussed this evening, please contact us. Uh, write to us, uh, send an email, whatever. Find out more information. And especially if you're have never obeyed the gospel, you don't want to end up like New Age worshipers who are worshiping themselves primarily, but you need to find out about the true and living God. We are the children of God who worship God, who honor the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is only His blood that can save you from your sins. There is no, no concept of sin, by and large, in the New Age religion. But there is in truth in the Bible. And no, the Bible does not teach that we were born in sin. Some false teachers, some false denominations teach that, but it's not biblical. We are created in the image of God, but we chose to sin. But through his blood, we can be redeemed and restored to the fellowship that we lose when we sin. And we have to repent of our sins, confess that he is the Christ, the Son of God, not that we're God, but that he is God, and then be buried with him in baptism for the forgiveness of those sins. If we can help you uh, who are viewing with that, please let us know. If you are here tonight 
uh, physically, you already know all these things and you've obeyed these things, but is there something else we can help you with? If there is, let us know while we stand and while we sing.